from the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. This is Preacher Edward speaking. We welcome you here in the auditorium. And you out in the radio listening audience, the most certainly welcome you and appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. God gave the word, great is the company of those that publish it. And you out there in the radio listening audience can do someone a favor, especially a shut-in. If you just call them and tell them to tune in, WNGC, the big giant station here in Athens, and get this hour coming up. We do want to be an inspiration. Tape today will be tape number 331. I'm speaking on the subject, Seeking the Lost. You may turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 19, will you please? Luke chapter 19, Seeking the Lost, and the tape 331. Now, you can get this tape by writing in requests. It's in the gift of $3 or more to help take care of our radio expense. Now, during hot summer months and people on vacation, many things happening. A lot of people spending their money right and left, east and west, north and south. Sometimes they forget about the faith ministry, a ministry that's been proven of God, a ministry that God's blessed, a ministry that they know is of the Lord. And that makes it rough on the uh, preachers trying to promote it. And this ministry, it's been on there almost 40 years daily. It's not a fly-by-night situation. It's a proven, established ministry to the glory of God. And i like to hear from you. Now, the preacher has a birthday coming up next Saturday. It might be in appreciation for our ministry. You might want to send in a birthday card or maybe a, a gift to be used in the ministry. The Lord spares me next Saturday. I'll be two score, two decades, half a dozen years, 12 months, 52 weeks, 365 days old next Saturday. That's my age. And uh, I can smell wood burning now, but don't bother about it. Just get into the scriptures. You don't need to know too much anyway. And so, uh, in that respect, then you might start singing, Get away, old man, get away. Now, I don't want you heisting that tune up here on me. So I have to speak in parables to kind of keep you happy and keep you in that song. And so you turn then to Luke chapter 19 for the reading of God's wonderful word. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down, received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he had gone to be guest with a man that was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Notice verse 10. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now Jesus came into this world to provide a way that people might go to heaven. And he came because it was his will of the Father in agreement with the Holy Spirit that he came. He had lost people on his mind. He wanted to get people saved that they might go to heaven. Now when Jesus left this earth, he left that responsibility resting upon our shoulders. It rests upon you, it rests upon me, 
And it's our responsibility to get the message out and to try to reach sinners. Not many, many sinners being saved today, but that doesn't re relieve us of our responsibility because it's our responsibility to witness, to try to win people to God, and God will hold a person accountable if they refuse to accept the witness. And so we're to witness. Now, some people get the idea it's the preacher's business to win all the souls, but that is not true. The preacher ought to be a soul winner, but he's the under-shepherd, and she uh, shepherds do not produce sheep. Sheep reproduce sheep. It's your responsibility to win people to God. It's your responsibility to get them under the influence of the gospel. It's your responsibility to talk to them personally. And win them to Jesus Christ. And then bring them into the house of God. Now God never told the sinner, get up and go to church. Never. If that sinner comes to church, you ought to thank God that he's come along with God's people. And he's in the service. But God didn't tell him to go there. Didn't command him to go there. But uh, God commands his people to come. And for them to go out and bring in that sinner. Now that sinner is dead. He's dead in trespass and dead in sin. He cannot see the need of even coming to the house of God unless he's been brought under conviction by witnessing from someone that's what brought him in that he might come to know the Lord. God moves in that way. And as we serve God, many times we just often come in and we enjoy the service. We love the singing. We like the fellowship. We pray. We contribute. And we associate with each other. We love that. That's wonderful. That should be among God's people. We need more of that. But we seem to forget about there's a man out yonder on the road to hell. That man is lost. And if somebody don't reach that man, he's going to hell. If somebody had not became interested in me, I wouldn't be standing here behind this pulpit today. Had not somebody, had not become interested in my spiritual welfare, some of you sitting out there and in the radio listening audience has been saved under my ministry might not have been saved today. Somebody became concerned about me. And yet we move along and say, well, they know where the church is and they know what to do about it. And, and we just go along and we'll go to the house of God on Sunday and worship. And then we'll go along and forget about it. But that's not the way it should be. When you come into the house of God, you should come in to worship. So I told our people on Wednesday night, worship is based upon uh, the sacrificial lamb, the shed blood, the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. The first place in the Bible where you find the word worship, you find it in Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham and Isaac headed for Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah. Abraham said to the servants, he said, you remain here. I and the son will go yonder and worship. And we'll come back again. That's the first place in the Bible you find the word worship. It has to do with a death. has to do with shedding of blood. has to do with obedience. Now when you come into the house of God, you're not coming in the house of God just to see and be seen. You're not coming in to be neighborly. You're not coming in as kind of a little social activity. You're coming into the house of God to worship. When you walk in this churchyard, you ought to have that Bible. And somebody says to you, where are you going? What do you have? You say, I have the word of God. I'm going in God's house to worship. And when you come into God's house, you should have that in mind, that you come here primarily to worship and to glorify God. And that worshiping has to do with his death, burial, and resurrection, his precious shed blood, his imputed righteousness. And you should have that in mind. Don't come in in a give you manner. A giddy man or other. Don't come in in, in a, a frivolous type attitude. Uh, don't come in in a happy-go-lucky kind of spirit. Walk in the house of God and say, me and my family, we're walking in this place to worship God. That's exactly what God wants, is to walk in and worship Him. We worship Him in our prayer, in our attitude, in our conversation, in our singing, in our, in our, in our teaching, and in the preaching. We come in to worship God. And after we come into the God's house to worship God, it's our sole responsibility to say, 
I've been in God's house worshiping today. That poor sinner's never worshiped God. He may have worshiped idols, but not God. He doesn't know what it's all about. Now, it's my responsibility to get him saved that he too might worship God. And so we come to worship. And when we come to worship, we leave here with one thing in mind. And that's to try to reach that sinner for Jesus. Go seek the sinner. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And we need to do exactly that. Jesus came for that purpose. It's the great commission. He tells us in Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Go ye therefore in all the world. Go and teach the nations. Baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There we're to go with them to God. And teach them. Baptize them and so forth. More than a hundred people die in the world. Every minute they go out to meet God in eternity, most of them, 90% of them more, go out unprepared to meet God. How terrible. Now we do have some places uh, where they're deeply concerned about soul winning. And you've heard me mention this before in one of the places in hell. Down in hell today, people are disturbed down there. They're weeping, they're wailing, they're crying. They would give anything in the world if they had your opportunity. To win somebody to God, and especially their loved ones. In Luke chapter 16, verses 27 and 28, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house by a fire brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Down there in hell, they're concerned. Oh, how they'd like to have the opportunity we have. If God should open up hell and say, I want the inmates of hell to get out of here, go back to the earth, win people to God, in five seconds time there wouldn't be one inmate in hell. Every last one of them would be upon this earth, going from place to place, from house to house, from loved one to loved one, with a broken and weeping heart, trying to get them to come to God. And so, but they can't do that. We have another place that's deeply concerned about lost sinners, and that's heaven. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15 and verse 10, Likewise I say unto you, that there is re rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Just as certain as you're sitting out there, people in heaven are concerned about lost sinners down here. And the Bible said there's great rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now listen to me. If hell is concerned and heaven is concerned, then we're the only ones can do anything about it. Hell can do nothing about it. Heaven can do nothing about it. Jesus left that responsibility to us. Now we're the only ones. I mean true born again believers. We're the only ones that can do anything about lost sinners getting saved. And we're the less concerned about it. And we're the only ones that could do anything about it. I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to take it to heart. How many people have you won to Jesus personally in your lifetime? I mean, you just sat down and talked to him and won him to God. Or you talked them into going with you to church or going to some preacher. And they were won to God. How many have you won to God? How many? God expects you to do it. Oh, you say, now, preach, Edwards, I just can't very well do it. Yes, you can. Don't let the devil tell you you can't. Jesus said the fields are white under harvest and the labors are few. And in every direction you look, there's multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of sinners going to hell. When you walk down the street or when you look at the TV screen from some city and you see great mobs of people, you can mark it down in your mind. More than 90% of those people are headed straight to hell as they can go. People are lost. Very few people find the way. Jesus said straight and narrow is the way and only a few will find it. It's our responsibility to get these people to God, to witness to them, to tell them about Jesus. I shall never forget the first person I have went to God I was responsible for. I won't go into the detail of it, but it thrilled my heart. I'm telling you, I was a young Christian. I rejoiced. I praised God. I was so happy that I had won that man to God. And I, he, he got saved. I mean, he come to know God. 
by faith in Jesus Christ. That did something to me. And I'm going to tell you something too. If you win a person of Jesus Christ, it'll set you on fire. It'll give you a little taste and you want to go and do more for God. Somebody said one time they like to make money and like to save money. And they like to go put that money in the bank. And they said when you go put your first money in the bank, you can't hardly wait till you go put some more money in the bank. And the more you put in the bank, the more you want to put in the bank. And you can't hardly wait to get that check to the bank. And, and you head there immediately when you get your check, put it in the bank. Because you just want to read or do that. Uh, and uh, you, you, you're you thrilled over it. Now listen, that's the way it ought to be in soul winning. When you win one person to Jesus Christ, that should set you on fire to go after someone else. Dwight L. Moody, one of the greatest soul winners, never walked in shoe leather. When he would win a man to God. He had hooked him up with another fella and say, I want you fellas to go out together now and win somebody else to God. And he sent them out two by two. And they would go out and win somebody else to God. And he'd hook that up, person up with someone else, and they'd go win somebody to God. Now God expects you to do a witnessing for him. Now you can't save anyone. No man can save any man, and we can't save ourselves. You have a lot of people today that think they can save themselves, but they can't. They'll wind up in hell realizing they've missed it. Now, you can't save anybody, but you can witness. You can witness. You can tell them about Jesus. You can try to win them to God. And if you can win them to God, God does a saving. The Lord does a saving, but God will use your witness. Somebody gave a dear colored man a track one time and and he asked him, said, you know what that is? He said, I sure don't. He, and he said, that's a track. Uh, that's, that's a gospel track. That's a track. He said, yes, a track. I understand what a track is. A little later on, he came back, and there he saw the same fellow, walked up to him and said, you sure told the truth about what you gave me the other day, that track. said, that thing, said, I read it, and that thing's been tracking me ever since I read it. Well, it'll track you, it'll get you. The word of God, God will use his word. He promised to do so. God didn't say, now I'm going to give you wisdom to know how to do this and you do the job. God said, you witness for me. You tell what Jesus did for you. The apostle Paul never got tired telling about how God saved him. And you can tell how God saved you. Somebody said one time he's standing at the counter where they're checking out grocers and uh, he's supposed to be an outstanding preacher and while they're checking out grocers there he won six people to God. Don't believe a word of it. You don't win people to God like that. Man told me he's coming up from Florida stop to a man put some gas in the filling station in his car to the filling station and while that man was running gas in his automobile he won him to Jesus Christ. Don't believe a word of it. You don't win them like that. The Spirit of God has to get a hold of them. you got to mean business. And uh, do it at a time when God can speak to their hearts. And get out and look them in the eyes and tell them they're going to hell. And Jesus died for them. And get them under conviction. And you win them to Jesus Christ. A lot of this easy believism today and high precious stuff we have today is filled churches up all over this country. And they've been pulled green and they've soured up on the preacher and the church and everybody else. And the very few people are, are enjoying salvation anymore. Too many people pull green. you got to get a person under conviction and let him know that he's lost and let him want to be saved. And you can get him saved. That's your responsibility to tell him about Jesus. Preach to him. Witness to him. And when you do that, God takes care of the rest. Now, there's a great value placed upon a lost people, upon a soul. Uh, if you notice in Mark chapter 8 and verse 36, For what should it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? The Bible tells you your soul, the soul of that lost man, is worth more than all the wealth of the world. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 and 19, the Bible said we're redeemed not with silver and gold or precious stones, but we're redeemed, we're bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Now God's business is a wonderful business. 
And in the, the blood of Christ is invaluable, more valuable than precious stones or wood or gold. And when you win a person to God, remember you're saving a soul from hell. That is, he gets saved by what you did. God saves him. And that means he doesn't have to go to hell. Now you think about that. He doesn't have to go to hell because you want him to Jesus Christ. We got to seek these fellows. I use that term because in my text where Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. But we got to find these people and uh, tell them about Jesus. Or they're our neighbors. You work with them every day. You talk to them on the phone. You rub shoulders with them every day. It's always good to have some good gospel tracts. I always carry some with me. In my pocket I carry gospel tracts and, uh, and I use them. And in my pocket, if I have a little testament, I always carry that a lot. Wouldn't go without it. I, I take them, I use them, I give them out. And, uh, and we, we reach people to God sometimes. And we got my little testament back here in the Psalms. I never go without that. I want to stay equipped. There's a man one time walking down the street in Atlanta, Georgia. And he saw a gospel tract, very attractive looking piece of paper. And it was one printed by the Gospel Hour in Greenville. And so the rain had come along and washed it down a drain, but it was there and looked in pretty good shape. It kind of dried out. And this man reached down and picked it up and looked at it and kept looking at it and carried it home and looked at it and read it as God's plan of salvation. And he got under conviction and God saved him. And he wrote the preacher in Greenville and told him that he had been saved by reading one of his tracts he found in a drain where the water washed it down the side of the street. See, when you get literature, when you get the gospel literature in the hands of people, you don't know what God's going to do with it. I was in a meeting yonder 50 miles north of New York City many years ago. There's a dear lady who said she had a, a daughter, I believe, in Germany, best I can remember, and she wanted to see her saved. And I want to know if I let her have a, a track. She liked the track I had, since so she believed that her daughter would read that. I said, yes, dear lady, I'd like for you to send this track to your daughter. Oh, she said, I'd be delighted to do so. And she sent that track, probably plus other good gospel leader to her. And after a period of time, I heard from this woman. And she said her daughter had received that track in Germany and had read it. And God spoke to her heart. And she got saved, and she's praising God, rejoicing over the fact she come to know the Lord Jesus. When you leave a gospel track in the hands of someone, you know what's going to happen. You ought to carry some with you all the time. Carry them with you. If you go into a cafe and eat, if you leave a tip, leave a track. Now, if you're going to just leave a dime, don't leave the track. Uh, you go to another, another table and leave it over there. Don't let them know you're that cheap. But anyway, uh, uh, seriously speaking, uh, you leave a, a, a good tip for the waitress. That's where she earns a living. Leave her a good, nice tip and a gospel track. Now, if you're going to leave a, a penny in a gospel track, that'll be a reflection on your testimony because your name's on that track and you as a Christian. There's a way to do a thing and do it right. And you should do that. Now you save a soul from hell, you cover a multitude of sin. The Bible said when you win that sinner to God, you cover a multitude of sins. You cover up a lot of heartaches and suffering. A lot of people have suffered because of sin. But whenever they got saved, that changed the house. That changed the situation in the home. And the mother began to be able to live. And the children began to be able to survive. Because the old drunken husband got saved... And God made a sin out of him. And you don't have to be dead with old age. You don't have to be in middle age. You don't have to be in your youth to win people to God. Old people win people to God. Young people win people to God. Middle aged people win people to God. In other words, anybody that's intelligent enough to witness, to tell how Jesus saved them, get out of, tra get out of track, pray, do what you can, invite people to church, Beloved, you can do it. I don't care who you are. And if you're a born-again believer and you don't do it, you're the loser. Many of you heard me tell about the tabernacle where I ran the meeting years ago. man drove up there and old A model Ford had on a pair of overalls, which is all right. Came in and got saved. He went out every night 
and filled that eight mile of Ford full of people and brought them in out of the country and out of the woods and out in the sticks. And he brought them in. And did you know 18 people that he brought to that tabernacle during that two weeks meeting found Jesus? And did you know out of that meeting, I don't know whether they all came, that he brought or not, uh, five young preachers surrendered to preach out of that one meeting? Beloved, that man went out and brought him in. He couldn't preach. He told him, I want you to go to church with me tonight. And he brought him in. And I preached. And the Holy Spirit worked on him. And they got saved. He only did what he could. Was overalls every night, which was fine. He come barefooted, as far as I'm concerned, you get souls like that to God. And he uh, came in, and people got saved right and left. See, our trouble is we don't care anymore. We don't care if people go to hell. I got lost loved ones uh, some on a banana peeling right now, one foot in the grave, lost on the road to hell, and liable to slip on that banana peeling at any minute. And you got loved ones like that. And we got friends like that, and we don't seem to care anymore, and just let them die and go on to hell. God have mercy on us. We should need to do everything we can to win people to God. That's the way you build up your church attenders. Get out and win them people to God, bring them in, and get them to come to church with you, and do what you can in that respect. Now the Bible says in Psalms chapter 92 and verse 14, you should bring forth fruit in your old age. You're not too old to win souls. The older you become, the more effective your soul winning should be. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 6, a little child shall lead them. I know that's talk about the millennium, a little child leading the line around. But even a little child today can have great influence over their parents. I've experienced that. In the city of Greenville one time, I had a tent erected there. A little nine-year-old boy came uh, be be begin coming at the beginning of the meeting, and God saved the little fella. And he'd come up and say, Preacher, I want you to uh, get my mom and daddy saved. I said, Son, let's get them to the tent if we can. He said, I'm trying. I said, Keep on working. He said, I'm trying. Uh, just before the meeting was over, he came up one night and he said, Preacher, Mom and Dad is coming tomorrow night. I said, Wonderful. We'd we'll be most prayer, be in most prayer for him. And he went out grinning. Sure enough. That night he came in, and he stood between his mother and daddy. The little fella looked at one, he looked at the other, and big smile on his face. He just knew God's going to save his mom and daddy. He just had the assurance of that. He wanted them to get saved. And when I preached, gave the invitation, he stood between them. He looked at his mama, and he looked at his daddy. And then all three of them stepped out and came down that sawdust trail, fell on their knees, and gave their hearts to God. There that little boy led his mother and daddy to God in that respect. Little children can do it. Children many times can reach their parents and get to their heart quicker than others. Now we need to do something about it, not just sit around and sing, I shall not be moved. We need to do something about witnessing and do something about getting people to God because time is running out. Old Barber one time, his name was Sam. He lived in the community. Everybody loved Sam. Only Barber in town. Everybody knew him. Sam went fishing one day and fell out of a boat. And he drowned. And they searched for his body and searched for his body for several days. And people wept. They cried. They did everything they could to find Sam's body. They talked about what a great fellow he was. But Sam wasn't saved. And he drowned. And they finally found his body. Brought him in for the funeral. Placed him in the coffin out in front of the poor pit. And the preacher got up and said this. He said, if you people would be as concerned about Sam's soul as he was in finding his body, he wouldn't be in hell today. And how true that is. We get awfully upset about people's condition and so forth. We need to be concerned. But we don't give a rip about their souls that's going to hell. You're determined you're going to be a soul winner. Get out and seek the lost. Somebody right now, if you mean business right now, somebody got to lay on your heart and you can start working on it. You say, preacher, I just don't know how I can do it. I'm not a good talker. Don't tell me that. You get out on a street corner somewhere and hear you talking a block away. Oh, uh, you somebody pass by your house, hear you and your wife trying to reason about something a mile down the road. You, you, you're a good talker. That's, that's not it. Jesus said, you follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
You have one responsibility. You surrender to God, be in God's perfect will, and follow Jesus, and He'll make you a soul winner. He'll make you a fisherman if you want to be. Now, He'll not force you to do it. But I'll tell you, you should be glad you did when you come to the end of life's journey. And we need to do it. We need to. That's coming a time whenever we're going to stand before God. And the subscription, the Bible, it tells us something. I want you to let this ring in your ears. You might jot it down. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, the Bible said, He that winneth souls is wise. Now let that sink in deep down in your ears. He that winneth souls is wise. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, let's make a connection. He that winneth souls is wise, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Did you get that? The Bible said, He that winneth souls is wise, and then if he be wise and soul winning, he's going to shine as the brightness of the stars forever and ever. You've heard the old song, Are There Any Stars in My Crown? That old song might have a greater message than you think. It may not be like the church over here in Madison County. They had a church on one side of the road and a church on the other side of the road. And was having an August meeting and was up singing. One man just stopped to listen a little bit. And church on the left side of the road is singing, Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown? One on the other side of the road was singing, No, not one. No, not one. Well, we need to realize that God wants us to win people to Jesus. And God will lay on your heart right now somebody that you can win. Somebody in your family, maybe a child, adult, a young person, somebody. God will lay on your heart if you want to win somebody to Jesus. And if you do, that's one of the greatest things you ever did in your life. And then if you don't, it's going to be one of the greatest losses you've ever had in your life. The Bible tells us Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost, went back to heaven, turned that job over to us, and that's our responsibility. Let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, today we deeply disturbed because of our people not winning souls to you. Not getting sinners under the influence of the gospel. Not telling people they need the Savior. God help every one of us. Lord, I'm not blaming the people here in my church any more than I blame myself. But our Father, we all need to kindly freshen up and determine that we're going to try to reach somebody for God. Keep souls out of hell. Do that that you commanded us to do and told us to do when you left. And Father, we're not doing it. You said for us to do it, we're not doing it. Help us not to continue being disobedient, but to win souls to Jesus as we sojourn. Help us, our Father, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Debbie Plessa stands there so. You listen to me. If God is speaking to you about this matter of winning somebody to God or uh, any other reason or joining the church or what not or getting right with God getting saved or what not would you obey the Lord and come down here and let us help you we do want to help you would you come we'll gladly help you come right on down let us help you